So welcome everyone to the third panel of the 2022 uh, Annual Electoral Integrity Project Workshop. Uh, my name is Toby James. I am um, going to be chairing this session. Unfortunately, our chair couldn't, couldn't make it. Um, but we're very much picking up on the themes from yesterday where we introduced this idea that perhaps the world is seeing uh, electoral backsliding alongside democratic backsliding. And so the papers today will kind of pick up on this theme by, to begin with, and we'll take the papers in the order of the program. Uh, Holly will introduce her paper looking at whether there is electoral backsliding going on. And then we've got papers, successive papers, looking at some of the challenges um, that we are facing in countries around the world. So presentations are aiming for around uh, kind of 12, 13 minutes, um, after which we've got Anna coming in uh, with her discussants comments. Please do feel free to use the chat uh, in order to kind of give comments to uh, presenters. They very much welcome uh, your ideas and your feedback. And as ever, please do kind of follow the EIP tradition of providing your comments in help, helpful and supportive manner that helps the authors uh, kind of with their work. So without further ado, uh, we'll go straight over to Holly to introduce the, the first paper. Okay, so can I just get a confirmation everyone can see and hear me? All good. Perfect. Wonderful. All right, so um, as Toby mentioned, um, I, oh, it's it, it, apparently Toby's name isn't showing up on there, but um, this is a paper that is joint with um, myself and Toby James. In my original slides, his name shows, but that's okay. Um, but he's been taken for chair duties today, so uh, all you get is me. And so we're really motivated by this, the theme of the workshop being um, electoral backsliding. Um, oh, and show. Wow. Okay. We get the animation again. Oh, there's his name. There we go. All right. So our motivation here is this idea of, is there an electoral backsliding happening? You have probably all very familiar with the democratic backsliding literature, um, whether um, elections, or sorry, whether are the quality of democracy has declined in recent years, that's still open to debate. Some people saying that really it's just a, a change in expectations um, and a change in public perceptions and how the public sees their democracy. Um, some people noting some demonstrable quality changes uh, in, in democracy in some established democracies that we might've thought really were the, the gold standards of, of democratic life. And so uh, Toby and I were wondering this question of, you know, are elections following this trend or are they, um, you know, really something separate that, that we, we can note? And so um, a large amount of the motivation for this paper is looking at what has been going on around the world. Um, and we see this unwillingness to accept election results as the new frontier of electoral malpractice. There's an image from the storming of the Capitol there in the United States. This increase in disinformation and fake news and the new cyber threats to democracy and to elections, um, seeing a stalling of progress on electoral boundary issues, uh, many countries bending electoral rules, for example, term limits being changed, um, it, and uh, seeing countries that you know previously were on their way to being much more democratic um, becoming ath essentially authoritarian regimes. Um, and so this was the motivation for the, for the paper was to say, is there really an electoral backsliding happening alongside this potential democratic backsliding? Um, so we're interested in these two questions. First of all, can we see patterns of decline and improvement on electoral integrity in the past century? Um, and then kind of narrow in on the past decade. Um, and is this something, an aggregate trend or is this uh, something specifically for only some indicators of electoral integrity? And then the second question was, what then can drive or account for the changes, whether they be positive or negative, of electoral integrity over time? And um, so what is it that's really driving these shifts if we see them? Um, and so to do this, we're using two very rich sets of data. Um, so first of all, as everyone knows, the Varieties of Democracy Project has data going back to the, the late 1700s. Um, and it, it's a country year uh, unit of analysis, and it has a number of questions regarding um, electoral integrity, things like electoral management body, autonomy and capacity, the voter registry, vote buying, intimidation, competition, et cetera. So it's got a, few, a, a number of, of really interesting indicators of electoral integrity, and that's coded by experts at the country year level. 
And then of course, um, we're, we're all also interested in seeing what we, what we can tell from the 10 years of PEI, of perceptions of electoral integrity data. Um, and that follows election to election. Um, it has a broader series of questions following an 11 stage electoral cycle and then sub questions within each of these stages of the electoral cycle. So maybe we can pick up on more specific trends looking just at this past decade. Um, and so we'll, I'll plug right into the results um, because there's, there's quite a few interesting things that I'd like to, dem like to show here. So the first question is, well, are there really patterns of decline and improvement in electoral integrity? A lot of people note that for the quality of democracy, are elections following these trends or are elections um, doing their own thing essentially? So on the left, you'll see the, the VDEM indicators and the figures suggest three main waves of global improvements in electoral integrity that really do mirror those um, commonly identified ways of democratization. Um, we do notice, however, that electoral integrity has been noticeably higher than most democracy indexes for sustained periods of time. In effect, we see almost elections dragging up these um, indicators of democracy, um, which, is, which is quite interesting to see that you know, elections are, are sometimes the, um, the kind of the last stitch effort, the last stand in democratic life um, and, and the quality of democratic life. Um, if we kind of move in on the last 10 years, um, you can see in the PEI index that we do not notice any aggregate decline or improvement of the PEI index over the last 10 years. Obviously there's, there's changes year to year, um, but there is no wholesale overarching decline. Um, and if you if you if you zoom in on the VDEM indicators, I know it looks like there's some amount of decline there, but really in the last 10 years, um, we're not entirely sure if that's just kind of a bit of a blip or if, if this is um, uh, uh, something that is more specific to specific indicators of electoral integrity. So that's what really then motivates kind of the bigger question of does this apply across the board or are there some indicators of electoral integrity that we note more consistent trends with? Um, so what I'd like to do today is, is look at um, a, few specific, um, a few specific areas of electoral integrity that we can um, note some changes at over time and, and consider how they have changed. Um, and so we'll start with the electoral management bodies, you know, the nuts and bolts of, of actually running elections. Um, and we notice in the VDEM data that by the 1990s, when the third wave of, wave of democratization was well underway, we see a really sharp increase um, in both the variables of autonomy and capacity, most notably in this uh, in electoral management autonomy really rises quite sharply. Um, and if that makes, seems to make sense to us, in this period of time, we also see an increase in electoral assistance, an increase in election monitoring, the rise of international frameworks for electoral management. Um, and really, it was at this time that the independent model of electoral management, the independent EMB, became really the gold standard of what was being adopted around the globe, especially in newer democracies. Um, and so it's, it's unsurprising that around the 1990s, we see this very sharp increase in EMB autonomy and also capacity coming alongside with it. Um, at this point, we see a bit of a flat line. Um, there seems to be a, you know, a bit of an increase, but then things tend to level out in the last decade. But in fact, in, when we look at autonomy, there is uh, quite, quite a decrease that we see in electoral management autonomy in the last decade. Um, we suspect this has to do something with the fact that those um, in government um, have sought to manipulate elections through um, their election management bodies, seeing that independent institutions can be independent, but in name only. And in real practice, uh, some other dimensions of autonomy can be eroded, um, even remaining within this model of independent electoral management bodies. Um, so we do see some decline in, in autonomy, uh, whereas a capacity is really flatlined in the last decade. The, these trends do not show up in the PEI data. Uh, we ask a bit of different questions, impartiality rather than um, more formal autonomy. Um, and these, we, we do not notice any particularly st statistically significant trends of decline um, in their performance over time. 
Uh, moving on to the dimension of competition. So the idea that election really needs to be an actual deliberative competition between various um, parties and candidates. Once again, we notice a very sharp increase in competition around the 1990s, that third wave of democratization really showing up in multi-party competitions um, when, when there was really an expansion in, in the types of, of parties and candidates um, that were able to participate. But then we notice uh, it, it's flat lines really. Since, since the 1990s, there, there really hasn't continued any sort of trend um, towards better competition. And we see this as well in the PEI data where there's a flat lining of indicators of fair competition. And that includes some of our uh, indicators of things such as are all genders and are all, are all minority groups able to contest in elections. Despite some of the strides made in, in diversity and many other aspects of society, um, we don't see that uh, similar increase uh, in um, the ability for robust competition uh, happening in the last 10 years of elections. So again, a situation where there is definitely a rise in um, the quality of elections uh, following the rise in democracy and then a flatlining in the last um, 10 to 20 years. Campaign finance is one area we talked about a lot yesterday in, um, in the discussions in the preliminary panel, that opening panel where we talked about how campaign finance was one of those areas that continues to be a, a key struggle in electoral integrity. And so the VDEM indicators uh, demonstrate some increases over time, um, a bit more like the um, EMB indicators that there's a bit more of a steady increase um, in the quality of, of campaign finance. The two indicators here for VDEM are the disclosure of donations and the public financing of parties and candidates. And so what we notice is that there, there continues to be in the last 10 years an improvement in the disclosure of donations. Um, we noted uh, again in yesterday's panel that transparency regarding who is making donations, how is that those funds are being used, um, is one of those areas that that has really been a lacuna within um, many of, of the laws uh, and and sorts of constitutional requirements for elections. Um, and so there has been some recognition of that over time and therefore um, some increase in, in, in states noting that they need to, to start having a little more transparency within the role of money in politics, whereas it previously might not have been legislated at all. Regarding uh, public financing, we see a bit of a flatlining again in the last 10 years of, of data that we have. Um, that those those countries that I think that were really interested in public good financing political parties and candidates saying that they were a public good that required some level of financing have largely done that. And now we have a bit of a flat lining as many, as many countries that have chosen not to go in that model um, obviously haven't been shifting towards that over time. We do notice one interesting thing in the last 10 years of PEI data. As I mentioned yesterday, campaign finance is that area that tends to do quite dismal, but we have seen one improvement. Um, this question of do rich people buy election, there's actually a statistically significant improvement over time um, in this component of electoral integrity. Um, I like to say that it's probably because it was just so bad that there, there's, there's some improvement going on <laughs> um, over time. And so that's the one, one place that we do notice some increase happening over time. Um, and so, it, you know, perhaps it is a little bit of a good news story that the world is waking up to this issue of money in politics and that there, at least with some additional attention, there can be some improvement in this area. The last section that I just wanted to highlight, again, the, the paper itself goes through many, many sections of each stage of the electoral cycle. I'm just highlighting for today. Um, looking at the vote process and the vote count, and, and apologies the, the graph there for, for VDEM is a bit, a bit crazy. However, um, what you'll notice if you kind of follow the blue line and the gray line, we see almost a shift happening in the 1990s um, from government intimidation being the major form of electoral malpractice regarding the voting process, shifting towards vote buying. I like to say this is a shift between um, from sticks to carrots. Um, and this makes sense when we look at what was going on around the 1990s and the third wave of democratization, um, where government in intimidation gave way to um, perhaps more persuasive forms of, of electoral malpractice. We see this making sense in the context of the rise of or the fall of many authoritarian regimes in favor of hybrid regimes that are on paper democratic, but um, not actually in practice. 
And so um, what we see is, is an increase then in the practice of, of vote, buy, vote buying and finding other ways to manipulate the election that doesn't involve wholesale intimidation. Um, and in the PEI data, once again, we see very, very little in terms of trends um, over time that, that things tend to flatline. And this, this relates very much to the graph that I showed yesterday in the presentation, looking at uh, changes in PEI, we're all within kind of a four point um, scale. So there tends to be relative consistency within the quality of the vote process and counts. And that's something that is also borne out in the VDEM data where in the last 10 years, um, any sorts of rises or falls really have flatlined. So then the second research question that we're really interested in was, well, okay, what, what then can, can account for changes in electoral integrity over time? We're not seeing these whole scale aggregate changes. Maybe it's what's going on, because we definitely still, like we can see around the world that there are changes in quality of election around the globe. So what's really driving that and what can then predict where there's going to be rises and falls in um, electoral integrity? And here's where we can harness kind of the, the fact that we do have time series data um, for the quality of election over time. So for VDEM, that's a, a year to year and for PEI data, that's election to election. And what we're able to do is look at the change from one year to the next year or from one election to another election in terms of electoral integrity, both the broad indicators, but then also the components of that. And then we're able to also consider whether there are changes in structural institutional factors at the same time that can then account for these changes in electoral integrity. And so we follow some of the literature on democratic backsliding and waves of democratization, uh, uh, looking at the sorts of indicators that might help predict changes in quality of democracy. Things like um, wealth in the country, you know, that kind of the lipstick hypothesis going on there, um, levels of corruption, violence, so looking at a measure of public safety, wealth inequality being one that's very key, um, regional electoral integrity, so looking at that um, uh, learning or diffusion between region, within a region, um, and a measure of foreign assistance, so foreign attention at trying to improve or perhaps um, make the quality of an election less good um, within a country. And so what we're looking at here in these models, and I don't put up the models, you can look at them in the paper, but are the changes from time one to time two uh, in electoral integrity alongside the changes from time one to time two in these particular um, structural and institutional factors. Um, and I'm gonna point out three main findings that we are gonna dig into a little bit deeper in the next draft of the paper. Um, we do notice that there's definitely trends regarding regional electoral integrity, that as um, electoral integrity within the region, and again, you know, for example, in the PEI, we're using the VDEM indicator, so we're not using the exact same indicator, that trends in, in changes within regional electoral integrity tends to influence changes in, um, in overall electoral integrity and component indicators. Um, so there's definitely something going on regarding spillover, diffusion, learning within regions um, that's worth digging into a little deeper. We also know that public safety or physical violence is, is important, especially for- Sorry, um, just, a, just a quick hang on, hang on time. I think time's just about up. Oh, good. Okay. I have one more slide. Um, EMV performance. Um, meaning that election management bodies need to have a, a situation where they they can be free from physical violence in order to fulfill their tasks and have high quality performance. And then we also notice economic inequality um, having an important role on, on some indicators, including EMB performance and notably financial transparency. Um, so in places where there is greater inequality in, in wealth, um, there tends to be perhaps a little bit more as well hiding of, of the role of money in politics. Interestingly though, not changes wholesale in GDP, that doesn't have the same effect as changes in the um, economic inequality within a country. So what can we conclude about all of this from the three research questions? One, there is an evidence, there is evidence that during the third wave, there was an increase in electoral integrity, most indicators followed by flatlining. Um, this relates to some of the research that we've seen on democratic backsliding that seems to suggest that um, there's there just has been this flatlining and people want things to continue to increase we want it to be more democratic but that just doesn't end up happening and that causes some disenfranchisement or not disenfranchisement, discontent about the quality of democracy because it's just not continuing to, to increase as we want um we see definite shifts in emb autonomy in the last 10 years and a shift from imitation to vote in, intimidation to vote buying um in the last few years we note the three 
uh, drivers, changes in regional electoral integrity, at levels of physical safety and economic inequality as well, being important regarding um, the quality of election over time. So oh, those were my extra slides. So I'll leave it there and I look forward to the discussion. Thanks. Brilliant, thank you, Holly. Uh, that's great. So moving quickly on then to a um, second presentation, which is from Farron and Sarah Birch, um, looking at extreme weather conditions and how this affects um, electoral integrity. Farron, over to you. Thank you. Can you guys see the slides properly? Yeah, all clear. Yeah. All right, excellent. Thank you. So let me put this bigger. All right, so, well, first of all, before I start, uh, allow me to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands in which I am, uh, not that we meet. I pay my respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to, to country. I recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Uh, after that, I wanted to introduce you the topic of this paper, which is, um, as you guys have seen, extreme weather and electoral fentalism in Honduras. It's Work work is co-working with uh, Sarah Birch and Anna. You have have to read the first attempt on the on the on the draft. So uh, thank you. First of all, we're looking very much forward to your comments. As you can see, it's a very initial draft. Um, now, for some of you, I've we've done both Sarah and I uh, previously have worked on issues on turnout and electoral participation mainly, as well as some issues on electoral integrity. But this is our first. I mean, at least my first, but not Sarah's, first of them on, on trying to see how um, how extreme weather events may impact may impact elections, right? Now, uh, and, and and for that, the first time or for this first first paper, and it's it's an ongoing project. Uh, we we have mainly focus, or you know, the motivation is whether you know whether. Hypothesis, we hypothesize or whether extreme weather events increment or not do have any impact on clientelism, right? It's because if and if it's so, it should go through both uh, supply and and demand and demand channels. Now the thing is that research on on that far is is kind of contradictory because on the one hand we find some people saying that yes. Uh, when there is a, an electoral, sorry, when there is a climate disaster, you know, being a flood or whatever, you're going to see huge amount of, uh, of aid develop to that area, and that will benefit brutally to, to, the, to the guys in power, right? And in fact, I think it's in Brazil what they call it that there is this drought industry. So basically, every time that there is a drought, there is benefit for, 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 the, for the guy in power, right? Uh, however, in other places, like you know, in Honduras or Pakistan, or you know, uh, there is no such evidence. So we are wondering whether this is uh, something that is that is happening or not. Now, it, the, the first step, the second part is where we've been looking at, and we, we have been focusing very much on on some analysis that have looked at the at the clientelization of disaster aid, right? And the study that we have been following closer is this work from Gallego in Colombia uh, that appeared in electoral studies a couple of I mean, four years ago, uh, give or take. And basically that's basically our, our blueprint trying to trying to, to do it right. But basically we've seen that there is seems some um, some ideas or some or some some evidence that certainly there is politicization of the disaster aid relief. And that may, may impact. So just following that, and we're going to be focusing on flooding. You can make an argument whether why not we focus on fires or whatever. Well, we decided to start with the floodings for the first time. And basically, our first hypothesis is pretty straightforward. And we argue that flooding will make more likely that voters will be targeted with clientelistic uh, exchange effort. Now, the thing is, as we were saying, is the clientelism, as you guys know, and very likely as has been explore or you already know it applies both or could work through a supply and demand channels right so both of those could be could be at stake so we don't know we don't know which one um which one is is at is at play both of them could be simultaneously right like you know on the one hand 
me as a political entrepreneur can offer you likely voters some some votes in sorry some cash in exchange of votes on the other hand you voters can approach me and you know suggest that I provide you with some with some with some with some income so here are the other two or the side hypothesis that we that we want to ideally we would like to to test and the one I'm saying ideally you'll see in a second why Finally, we also take into consideration the context and, and the actors, right? And by the context and the actors, we consider two things. The first one is um, the, 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 the organization of, of, of the country, right? And basically here, we're gonna be focusing mainly, uh, we're gonna try to compare the, the local level or municipal level, right? Uh, and see whether the share of the vote party affects or, or is benefited by when the flooding happens at, at the local level, basically whether there is a differential effect between local elections and presidential elections. And the argument would be also that the party in power at the national level should benefit more than the rest of the parties precisely because they control the cash to, to spoil, you know, basically to buy people if you want or to spend the money. Now, I don't know how uh, clear I have explained the, the 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 theoretical framework. Hopefully, more or less. Otherwise, I can I can always attribute it to waking up early this morning with my one year old kid and being eleven at night. Now, let me continue though. So, why we have decided to go to Honduras, right? And basically, the thing the thing we have to know about I mean, there are many things to learn about the country, but like a couple of things that are relevant is that. Uh, Honduras would be a partial democracy, you know, it has had a tortuous and unfortunate relationship with, with democracy, you know, and they had an, a partial uh, an, uh, a coup in 2009. Um, additionally, as this has been tested and shown over and over by many researchers around, around, around the world, is the country with the highest r rate of clientelism in the region. So, uh, you know, it is it is expected. And this is something that we have received, like we've done several interviews and basically some people disagree with some other of the people that we were interviewed, but everybody agreed, like they were telling us, no, no, this is entrenched. You know, this is something that, that happens company. So on the one hand, you have clientelism that is entrenched in society. But in the other hand, you call it, uh, you know, that the country is really vulnerable to, to, to tropical storms. And this is something that happened. Uh, actually, the, the same name of the country, Honduras, means, you know, it's deep. Uh, and we have, or the country has suffered, better said, several, several uh, storms, right? In, in 1964, Fifi. In the Hurricane Mitch in 1998, which many of you very, very likely uh, re remember, certainly Toby and myself because of age. Um, and then more recently, uh, Ed and Yota, you know, two or three years ago, where, where, you know, was all over the news, right? And that's on the one hand, this is, and then guys, this, this happens like every every once in a while, we have issues there. The other thing is, is that uh, because of climate change, this is also to expect, you know, it's one of the countries to be most affected by climate change. Mind you, I'm talking to you from, from Australia now, which we're getting flooded when we are not burned, but that's another story. Anyways, Honduras heavy, uh, heavily affected by, uh, by clientelization or by, by clientelism and highly affected by, um, by climate change, you know? So the other thing you I want you to have clear is basically here we're gonna focus on two main uh, element or main two main two uh, events. One is the 2017 uh, uh, floods, which affected around 40,000 people in 30 of Honduras municipalities out of 298, okay? And then in 2020, we have the major hurricanes in Danyota, and those were massive. I mean, this was like all around the country, right? And and I haven't included those maps, but I will include them on the map so you can see them now, right? So on the left, on my left, you can see the impact in 2017 by, by at the local level, all right? And to the right, you can see how massive how, the big impact of, of 2020, yeah? So we want to see how, okay, whether, which are the effects of, of each one of those of those uh, 
storms into people into into the into the thing into the into clientelism right and so basically we're trying to do two things uh, in our practical strategy base or is working at two levels at the aggregate and at the individual at the aggregate what we're trying to get is garnering uh and and if you guys have it i would appreciate because some of this data has been extremely painstaking i mean extremely painful to obtain still we're still arguing and, and talking to the to the to the providers of the data to obtain him but basically electoral results at the aggregate level for 2017 and 2021 now we're also needing 2020 uh, sorry 2013 and you can see guys the dependent variable there the dependent variable there um because we don't have 2021 whatever we want to talk about h2 and h3 we cannot say much bro uh, so what I'm going to offer you is more about the results at the individual level. Now, at the individual level, we can rely on the work from uh, Mitch Seligson and his colleagues in uh, Vanderbilt, I think they are, which they've been working on uh, LAPOP data. Now, they do those two questions that you can see here, in which they address you know, uh, more directly and, and a bit more <laughs> indirectly whether people have been subjected, subject to clientelism. Right. So C1, think it, did any candidate or political party offer a favor or a gift to somebody you knew or basically to straightforward to you in return of your vote, right? Here you can see which hypothesis can we test with this dependent variable method, etc. So this has been the main quantitative empirical strategy. We have also complemented with several interviews. The interviews lasted over you know on average 40 minutes with over 12 people uh we haven't included mainly many of those comments there in the in the paper and but we'll put them again um and basically here you know we were asking them about the general problems of Honduran politics the impact of the storms in the country clientelisms and then and then they were telling us amazing stories sad but amazing um and basically whether or how was the well, there was clientelization of, of the disaster review, of the disaster relief. Uh, all the, you know, here you can see the, the dates in which we were conducting the, the interviews. And here I'm gonna show you a bit of, of the results. Now, because I know that the, the paper is a bit back and forth with, I mean, you, you know, because of the dates and all the storms, you have to be uh, conscious about when, when to look at it. Um, we find uh, at the aggregate level the only thing we have find that is consistent is regarding hypothesis one which if you remember correctly is whether flooding makes it more likely that voters will be targeted with uh, clientelistic exchange efforts um but still where where we are not putting all our money there we we really need to to work this out a little bit more we still need more data from uh, the other, I mean, for 2017, that's fine, but we really need to, to, to get the other data to compare, right? But what we have found, which I think is quite cool, and I would appreciate any comment and recommendation, would be also here at the individual level. Now, the cool thing here is this graph, right? In which you can see that if you have been flooded in the past three years, you are more likely to, uh, uh, to to being personally targeted with clientelism. Yeah, some of you will tell me, well, you know, the margin of, you know, the confidence intervals here overtouch each other. Yeah, fine, sure, I see. But the, still, the point, you know, it's a significant, it's, it's you know, here it's around 22.5%, and this is almost 35. Sorry, sorry, almost 32. So it's almost 10 points more. Yeah, so basically what this is telling us is that people who have experienced flood are more likely to be targeted by politicians. And this is quite, I mean, this is not path breaking. I mean, we're not the first ones to find this, okay? But like, but this is something that it's that it's cool at, at the individual level. Here you can see the controls. And we have done this robustness check from uh, we were seeing whether, you know, how could we be a bit more confident about these results. And we rely on on um, on this methodology that has been recently proposed by Jordi Munoz and some other colleagues. Uh, which is this thing called unexpected events during survey, right? So the funny part is that when uh, when LAPOP, uh, when the LAPOP survey was fielded, um, there was uh, 
there was some weather, some weather that bring quite a bit of rain, you know? And basically there we were able to control between the people who suffer, sorry, between the people who didn't or not suffer the rain and the people who suffer the, the rain, right? And basically, you know, the flow was in the media. It was expected to, you know, that the Honduran people would be aware of, of the flood. Um, but what we find is that there was no evidence that the experience of the flood at the time of the survey impacted the respondents. So, so we're kind of confident that this, this result is, is kind of solid, at least following this, this, uh, this method. Um, I know I have to go wrapping it up now. So what I'll say is, you know, basically so far what we know is that um, what we find is that uh, there seems to be use of disaster and, and, and aid in order to, you know, to, to, to reinforce clientelistic, for, reinforces clientelism uh, policy or clientelism in Honduras, better said, um, that the recent flood experiences increase the likelihood that voters will be targeted by vote buying. And this has implications on how climate change impact elections. We don't think that our findings are, by the way, just uh, Honduras focus, you know, like we really think that, I mean, we have rely on a very conservative estimation method. If anything, we're underestimating uh, this explained on the paper and whatnot, but, um, but we think that there are many reasons to think that if it's going on in this country, there are not many theoretical reasons to not thinking that it's, it's not going on in, in any other countries. Anyways, uh, any recommendation or suggestion on how to improve this, on how to think it outside the box on how to another estimation approach or whatever, uh, happily, guys, because uh, we need to work. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Farhan. It's a fascinating, excellent paper. Thank you so much for presenting. And just to say, I think the paper is on the website. Um, so do have a look at there and just encourage everyone also to kind of use the comments box there as well. Um, I've been okay. trying to mess trying to message people to say on, on timing, but I realize that they might not be able to, to quite see the comments. Um, we think five minutes, two minutes, four minutes. Yeah, so, um, no, no, not, not at all. Um, so I'll, I'll heads up to, to Morgan and um, uh, to Rebecca, to allow you to, to self-regulate your, your time a little, bit, a little bit more. But um, over to you, Morgan, the floor is yours. Well, I'm just going to pretend I don't see the the, the uh, text either, so that's fine. It's a great strategy. <laughs> All right, I'm going to put this in Can everyone, can you see the screen? Yeah, very clear. All right, perfect. Okay, yeah, thanks for those, those two great uh, presentations so far. I'm going to talk a bit about a paper that I've worked on with my colleague, Nicholas Richstock, who's not here today, but um, is also based out of the University of Washington in Seattle. Um, and I'd also like to, to thank a number of, of um, assistants that we had on the ground in, in Nicaragua who helped out a lot, but chose to remain anonymous. And we haven't uh, found out a better way than to, to thank them anonymously, but we're hoping to, to do so in a way that won't, won't get them in trouble. But we can talk about that at the end. If anyone has any suggestions, that would be great. And so our, our paper today is, is called To Loser Goes the Spoils, Elections as Signals of Opposition Support. And... So the research puzzle here is about fraudulent elections. So a lot of the work we've talked about today and, and the rest of this conference, this workshop, talks specifically about more democratized countries, countries that are somewhat at risk of democratic backsliding. Uh, Nicaragua is a case where democratic backsliding ha has already occurred. This is a, a country that 10 years ago was nominally democratic, but today is hardly so, and very few people or organizations would consider it uh, a democracy. And so looking at the elections in this context, I think we can get maybe some views from the other side and how new technologies might alter, perhaps give us some hope that uh, maybe we can reduce democratic backsliding or bring some democratic consolidation back the other way. And so what we're looking at specifically is how information and communications technologies impact perceptions of wider regime support and potential action on behalf of citizens uh, in Nicaragua and potentially to generalize or to look beyond to other illiberal countries. In the past, the traditional theory of election support is that liberal leaders and autocratic leaders can use elections to their advantage. If you hold elections in non-democratic non spaces, you're able to use uh, the levers of power to keep people in the dark, so to say. Um, the classic uh, seminal 
work of Timur Karan on preference falsification uh, is, is featured heavily in this paper. And the idea, for those who don't know, is essentially that elections in particular can serve to promote the idea that the regime holds wider support than they might actually do amongst the population. And so in a case where let's say 50% of the population actually supports the government, if you're able to rig the levers of power, and uh, we can talk about the ways that they've gone about this in Nicaragua and other cases, uh, but you can maybe win 65%, 70% of the vote. And if you are in opposition to the government and you previously thought, well, maybe we have around 50% of the vote, we can try to stage some sort of coup or we can try to get public opinion on our side and win one of these elections. If you see 65 to 70% of your fellow citizens voting against you, even if that's unfair, you don't have any other levers uh, to view um, alternative sources of information, you're less likely, the theory goes, to then um, stand up to the government, which allows these illiberal regimes to persist longer. And so a lot of these papers were written in the context uh, before kind of the rapid spread of information communication technologies and social media data of the last 20 years. And so we basically set out to see if, if this rapid spread and access to information could have potentially altered in certain, uh, in certain states and certain contexts, how uh, beneficial elections could be and whether or not they could actually be a detriment to authoritarian governments where people have unfettered access to information communications technology. So essentially, if you look at this, uh, these plots here, we're essentially just adding one arm to the traditional theory and, and suggesting that potentially, if you have access to outside information through a phone or through a computer, you might have a different uh, impact. And we'll go over the, the hypotheses here in a second, but you might be affected differently than, than the traditional theory. And why might this be the case? And so we're looking specifically at contexts um, in, in authoritarian states where it's often very difficult to get perception data uh, because of the risk that comes to people filling out surveys. And so we try to get around this in a number of ways. We conduct this through a Facebook survey, um, and I'll talk about that in a bit if people are curious as well. But the reason we thought that this could be potentially um, a drastic alteration in the way that elections affect people's perceptions is because of the massive rise in election integrity or the, the massive rise of internet penetration over the last 20 years. Specifically, if you look at the, the countries that the, the PEI database, which we talked about earlier, um, says held low quality elections in the last uh, about 15 years, you'll see that the number of internet penetration in 2007, which is actually later than all of Timur Koran's work on this, as well as Gurdjieff's Magaloni and a couple of the other prominent works in this field were done. It was about 9%. It's now up to an average of 44% internet penetration across all the countries that hold a liberal election. So almost a fourfold, over a fourfold increase in the amount of internet penetration. So it's essentially gone from something that a very small cadre of individuals would have had to something that nearly the majority of the population has in a lot of these places. So our hypothesis is essentially that in the liberal states where citizens have access to uncensored information regarding the legitimacy of the government's election, it should decrease their perceptions of social societal support. So they should believe that fewer people in the, in the country support the incumbent than previously if you have access to the internet. Secondly, we look at whether citizens um, with access to uncensored information uncensored information regarding legitimacy, increase their perception of the citizen's willingness to engage with the opposition. So we don't just look at whether people perceive the incumbent to be more or less popular, but we also look at the mechanism and see whether they think that their fellow citizens are more likely to engage with opposition parties and potentially uh, attempt to overthrow these regimes. So the context, I won't dig into this too much, uh, but essentially Daniel Ortega and the FSLN, recent election in November uh, this last year, they won about 65% of the vote. Um, it was widely regarded as a sham election. Almost all opposition candidates were arrested in the months prior to the election and very few even stood. Um, and so there were massive boycotts, it was widely held. And if you had access to the internet, which about 56% of the country has regular access to Facebook, which is what we use, you would have seen many posts online and many movements online that discuss the illegitimacy of these elections. Um, and so to get at that, a number of surveys have, have kind of looked at whether or not people, how often people use Facebook, how often people use social media data. And we, so we take that just to give kind of a primer on things going on in Nicaragua. And you can see that just based on kind of no experimental data, but just based on survey data, the more often people use Facebook in Nicaragua, the, the less likely they were to trust the electoral institutions. So that's sort of along the lines of what we think, but not necessarily experimental uh, or causal evidence. 
And so to get at something a bit more causal, we use a survey through Facebook, which we do in, in th basically two waves, a cross-sectional survey. Um, and I think we, the interesting part here that people might enjoy is, is the survey questions we ask. We didn't really, we definitely didn't want to get anyone in trouble. And so we don't ask anyone directly their opinions. And we use a lot of proxies for a number of different kind of regime support metrics. But the general questions are something like this. If we selected 100 Nicaraguans from the population, then we ask basically, and the regime was free or for, if the election was free or fair, how many would vote for Daniel Ortega? So this is our question based on how much we think the population supports the incumbent. Secondly, how, how likely would the society be able to, or be willing to attend a meeting with the opposition? And how many would be willing to talk to the opposition candidates about political ideas? And so these are our two metrics focused on actual tangible qualities, they think, uh, engagement with the opposition. And so our results, as we hypothesized um, in the pre and post election periods, so prior to the election, um, about 43% I think slightly more than that, uh, believed that the wider population supported Ortega. After the election, uh, when there was a lot of uh, data coming out about the fraud and a, a lot of information on how illegitimate the election was, the same survey questions re were reduced by about 10%. Um, and so we see this as confirmatory evidence. This is significant at the 95% confidence interval. In terms of the opposition support metrics, you can see that's the exact opposite, which is what we also expected. So if you, prior to the election, people were less likely to believe that people would support engagement with the opposition. Um, and after the election, these both spike about almost 10%. You can see the table at the bottom, or they're all significant to 95% level. We didn't get as many respondents as we wanted. We were, I think, kind of conducting this in the dark. Uh, nobody had done a Facebook survey with incentivization, as far as we know, in Nicaragua around elections prior to this, and we weren't sure how many people we were going to get to respond. And we ended up getting about 350 respondents between the two waves, uh, which was enough to get statistical significance, but we of course would have liked it to be much larger as, as we all, all do every time. Um, government's proxy. So getting at somewhat of a mechanism here, it seems that most of the impact was on people who supported anti-government candidates prior to the election. So this is exactly what you would expect if you believe the idea of preference falsification. So amongst supporters of the government, which we proxy by asking people about which channels they trust most on television, uh, certain channels are associated with the dictatorship and certain channels are associated with the opposition. And amongst those who trust opposition channels more highly, there's a bigger spike in post-election support. And it's a much you know, lesser, I think there's no statistically significant difference between the pre and post-election results for those who supported the, the government channels. So conclusion, obviously there's, there's work to be done on this. Uh, I think these survey results are a good start to show that maybe there is some sort of increased cost to dictators in areas when there is access to information communications technologies, particularly in Nicaragua, it seems that access to Facebook allowed people to access true information about the election results, even though the government claimed to have received 65% of the vote. It doesn't seem like anyone interpreted the results that way at all. Um, and this spikes in data, I think, show that you can't necessarily get away with keeping people in the dark in the modern information age. There are, this is a very specific context. Um, there are many other, we, we sort of hypothesize a U-shaped graph where the more capacity a state has to limit or to kind of obfuscate the reliability of ICT information, the less likely this signal is to have an effect. And so if you get something, um, you know, more advanced technological dictatorships that are able to kind of flood misinformation onto websites that are able to uh, block using firewalls and those sorts of things on these sites, this may not have the same effect. And I think further research could kind of elucidate where exactly these impacts come into play. Uh, but we think it's a good start and we'd, we'd love to, to hear your thoughts on this. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Morgan. Um, great timing as well as a great paper. So uh, further ado, uh, we'll hand over now to Rebecca with the dynamics of democratic backsliding at elections. Uh, Rebecca, the floor is yours. Okay, now, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so um, 
I'm now presenting a part um, of my research that um, I conduct within the framework of my PhD. And um, here I'm particularly focusing on one um, kind of empirical case study that I'm conducting um, that should further help to um, understand better the interaction dynamics um, that happen around uh, democratic backsliding at elections. Um, so, yeah, first of all, maybe also to uh, about myself, I'm uh, working at a Peace Research Institute in Germany, Frankfurt. No, okay. So, um, what I'm interested in in this research is um, what kind of role do elections have uh, for democratic erosion or backsliding or what we also understand like for autocratization processes um, when you read the literature and there's a huge uh, kind of uh, literature available in academia um, they all outline that elections are uh, have an important role for manipulating um, but also for um, like for, for illiberalism and also for incumbents to kind of maintain their power. Um, so what I found interesting is um, that what are kind of the domestic um, context situations, what are the domestic dynamics and especially what kind of role do domestic non-state electoral actors have in the context of the democratic backsliding. And here on the right hand, you see um, one uh, poster banner that I took during my uh, field study in Kyrgyzstan, where you see Chaparov um, kind of um, pre um, outlining the importance of conducting um, transparent elections and clean elections and to show how uh, how good elections can be conducted in Kyrgyzstan while at the same time um, an autocratization process uh, was going on there were several kind of there were amendments to the constitutions um, there were also several restrictive laws on the civic and political environment um, also on the role of um, um, CSOs, there was a new NGO law adopted in the summer before the elections. Um, so I would like to understand more how all this comes together. So on the one hand, what you see um, is that democratic backsliding happens in a one or other way um, and elections are used for that. On the other hand, you see that there are different uh, reaction strategies uh, by civil society organizations that if you sum them up uh, based on the available literature, they are either maybe classified as resistance adaptation or resignation strategies. And I was um, or I'm interested in to understand, OK, why are the strategies different? Why can civil society organizations react in one case um, better to an autocratization process at elections than they can in another case. Um, so uh, to approach this research question, um, I did uh, two-folded um, empirical research. One is the case study on Kyrgyzstan and the other one is a case study on the role of domestic election observer groups um to better understand kind of the patterns that are there around electoral processes um, and why do i focus on um, election um, observation groups in particular domestic ones because um for the for my research um, as i'm interested in non-state electoral actors uh, they have a very particular role at elections um, they monitor the process but they are also the experts in the field they know very well what is the situation what kind of electoral malpractices are uh, ongoing in the country what is the context situation etc so um, i found that um, they are very relevant to be better studied um, in this context um, so on the one hand, um, if you, or if you look then at potential patterns that um, of reactions of domestic election observers, um, you can say, okay, resistance is, for example, when there is a certain mobilization, when um, there is the building of alliances and coalitions, um, adaptation strategies could be um, when um, there's a rebranding of the profiles, programs, the re-registering of an organization, non-coordinated action at elections, maybe also the reduced size of a domestic election observation mission, 
Um, and then resignation strategies would be when an organization has to leave the country, they have to close down offices, they close down programmatic priorities, and they cannot do what um, they intended to do in, initially. Um, so what I do assume in my research is that the, the way or the, the reason why different reaction strategies can be chosen is that there's a different level of electoral resilience in a country. Um, and depending on like what kind of strategy that is visible, um, the level of electoral resilience varies. Um, so what do I understand with that? Um, generally, I do understand the ability to withstand, to adapt and to recover from election related restrictions and repressions. Um, and in my research, I do use a functionalist approach. So this kind of three functions that should be there, also more an actor-centered approach to electoral resilience. Um, as I do look on um, civil society organizations, and in this particular case, domestic election observers. Um, and um, yeah, with that, I would like to connect to and kind of again emerging literature on democratic resilience there were two special issues recently published um, one that focuses more on democratic resilience and then one recently that was uh, published by Stolenberg, Bursel and Risse um, that focuses uh, for the first time also on a more actor-centered approach so actors other than the state and um, what makes them more resilient um, so in the um, continuous minutes, I would like to talk a bit about the methodological approach and then also to provide some of the first understandings that I have based on or kind of outcomes that, um, that are based on the survey. Um, however, um, I'm still in the kind of coding and analysis part, so it's only very preliminary. Um, but um, yeah, I hope in, um, in due time I can provide further kind of conclusions on it. So first of all, what did I do? Um, I con like I established a database of um, all existing kind of global uh, domestic election observers based on the global network of domestic election monitoring network and um, all the regional platforms in total there were 342 entries however then I, I needed to clean the database and cleaning the database meant that um, organizations sh should still be working existing um, and um, they should also have some kind of presence online um, so that I could be sure um, that they are uh, they are still operating um, and um, also for a matter from a from kind of e survey distribution perspective and um, operating email um, and an email functioning. So I ended up with having 206 organizations in the database. I distributed the survey via Lime survey in the, like email. I used in the English language for the questions, which I know is a kind of maybe backdrop to the survey as it was a global distribution. and. Um, I cannot assume that all organizations could reply um, in English or could understand English, but um, I had to take this into consideration in the survey design and included closed and open survey questions um, on different um, types or different information on the one hand, more like on more like organizational questions, but then on the other hand also um, on the mobilization factors and um, resistance, um, but then also um, on some indicators that I consider as relevant for electoral resilience. Um, so what I have, um, I got 45 completely and partially filled out questionnaires, um, of which 35 also included the um, optional section. Um, most of the respondents were with uh, or hold an executive function and were male um, and the majority of the organizations were located in one country um, as expected uh, only a few uh, did um, have some kind of regional presence and in, in addition to that i also conducted some interviews with some of the representatives um, of the domestic election observation groups. And maybe also to say something on the name, of course, you can also name it civic election observation groups. Um, 
but in particularly, as I'm um, in that case uh, interested in the, the domestic interactions, and I wanted to make a clear cut between international INGOs, um, I'm using the term domestic. Um, so um, to the preliminary results that I have so far, um, based on um, what I have uh, from the survey analysis, um, what is interesting um, that there the majority of the organizations they use strategies that are corresponding to um, resistance um, strategies. Um, however, when you look also on how the organizations fill out a survey, often there is a combination between resistance and adaptation strategies. Um, and only a um, few organizations did at the end use um, resignation strategies. Um, there's also, I think, for example, one um, comment that corresponds um, to um, these is in order to respond to shrinking civic spaces and difficult electoral processes, we worked on expanding the reach of our international election observation platform. We also continue to be in touch with international NGOs that monitor elections. Finally, we used some digital tools in our data collection matter to mitigate the risk of interference with monitors, um, online forms and um, mobile apps. Um, but then you also have the other cases where, for example, during the local elections, we were denied accreditation. However, we ask our observers to do citizen observation by staying in the victory to follow uh, the electoral climate accounting and the tabulation. Um, so um, when you look also at the, the reasons uh, behind um, the mobilization, you see that um, there is a high kind of normative ideational value towards the mobilization or the reason to why um, this organization mobilize. Um, so um, to give a democratic uh, vision and idea in face of autocratic tendencies is an important factor. Um, then as part of the mobilization, um, in uh, capacities um, building coalitions and alliances are among the mainly chosen strategies and then interestingly also the role of international donors especially western donors are important for these organizations um, to support their mobilization as well as other CSOs that are involved in the electoral process however cooperating in the one or other way with service delivery organizations um, is not the main, um, uh, let's say, that they are, are not among the main chosen partners, and neither are political parties nor opposition parties. And this is also, of course, due to um, the general understanding uh, and functioning of domestic election observers uh, to remain impartial in the process. Um, when you look at the characteristics of domestic election obser observers, and this is maybe one a starting point to explain why uh, they are able to react to autocratic tendencies well is um, that generally uh, there are multiple issued organizations and also multiple activity organizations that means that hardly any of the organizations does focus on um, domestic election observation only um, but they also have always other um, kind of uh, issues um, in uh, their working program um, other than election observation and also from the activities besides election observation like very important is for example also the um, the twicing functions and the capacity building um, and there a the transparency factor um, is also very important that um, domestic election observers generally tend to be very transparent in the way they work uh, and they, they make the decisions um, also to reduce the risk um, to be attacked by the government um, and um, all of them in indicated that they have on the one, uh, certain domestic and international partnerships, coalitions and are in uh, platforms. Um, what is also an important factor is the continuous involvement of uh, volunteers for the election day observation. Um, and the recruitment of them. However, volunteers do not play an important part in the day-to-day -day work of these organizations. What, of course, makes them more a risk or more vulnerable to uh, shrinking civic spaces 
is the dependency on foreign funding, which uh, was created, also was highly outlined in the, the survey, as the ma majority of the organizations receive foreign grants um, for, from uh, foreign governments, such as USAID or also from INGOs. And especially if you look at the, uh, like the role of uh, foreign agent laws um, that especially target organizations um, that receive grants, foreign grants, this is an important uh, factor. Um, so yeah, that's actually more or less what I would like to present now. Um, I didn't finish with the analysis on uh, further indicators on um, electoral resilience. So what I do can say um, in that sense from what I have seen so far, uh, trust plays an important role. And um, here I, um, I found that um, trust, especially when you have a competitive electoral environment, is important towards international organizations that then um, when you have um, contentious elections, um, and a competitive environment, election, international election observation missions to play an important role to step in and to kind of stay as a trust keeper for uh, domestic election observation groups. And as I outlined, outlined also before, um, for building coalitions and alliances, for enhancing the mobilization capacities of these organizations in order to be able to react to shrinking civic spaces, like to strategic election observation, uh, strategic election manipulation, um, international donors are um, important. And I think this fits well into the discussion generally, what is the role of the international community also, and whether they have a kind of positive or negative impact um, on a country uh, with their um, electoral support. Yeah, so I would like to leave it here and I'm very happy to further provide some um, results once um, I'm finished and to have the discussion on it. So thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Uh, again, another fascinating paper um, and they obviously citizen observer groups play such an important role here. Mm -hmm.